Hello, hello. Hello from Santa Cruz Mountains. Cold. Who would have thought California would be so cold in June? Good to see you all. Great to see you all. Is that your siren? Yeah, I just muted myself. That was. <laughs> Well, this morning, early, I was out and about, and uh, a woman walked by me with a big floppy pat, pat hat. Actually, I can tell you one more detail, which is she had just had an argument with her partner. I could tell that. And she like walked over, and I kind of joked around with her a bit. And then she looked at me very um, intently and seriously but also mischievously and she said happy father's day <laughs> and i just there was something so powerful about it and i can't at all articulate why it was but it's like um i do think it's it affected me and i think it's important that we say happy father's day <laughs> It's great. So, hope you're all doing well enough. It's a, always a good thing if it's if we're well enough these days. Mm. So we're um. At some point in the guided meditation, I'm going to do a little mudita, but it might be with a little bit of compassion, so karuna and uh, empathetic joy. Um, so we'll see how it goes. But we'll start with vipassana. And just often it's helpful to check into the quality of your awareness. And often it's helpful to notice if the awareness itself has any kind of <clears throat> receptivity. So often we're just not noticing if there's a kind of way that when we just settle in the attention within our body or around the surface of our body, if we're receiving the sensations that we're noticing. And often it's a lot of just checking to see if we're noticing only the visual image that usually will come to the foreground. A lot of the beginning of the sittings are just making space for dropping into a non-conceptual awareness, making enough space for it. So you're not rejecting a visual image of your body or hand, foot. But by becoming aware of <clears throat> 
how predominant the concepts and images are. We can just make space to receive the direct sensations that are happening moment by moment, just as they are. And so we bring in, if we can, a a kind of soft, gentle readiness. to connect our attention with just what appears, just moment by moment. So there's no right sensation or wrong sensation. Sometimes as we settle in, it's helpful to just notice that hearing is happening. So it's, of course, our ear doors are within our body. We're just like, again, playing again with a kind of spaciousness where the attention opens up wide and includes any sounds that are happening or silence. And it's a a wonderful place to check if there's a kind of receiving directly of the textures and sounds, including the silence. So, of course, we might notice siren or rooster, dog, car, voices. Those are just words that will come and go, thoughts, images about the sounds, but we just see, again, if we can just notice those come and go, no struggle, no fight, they come and go by themselves. And you drop the attention into that receptive receiving of the changing moment by moment, textures, vibrations that we call sound. And then you can just see again how the attention can be more like a pupil of an eye with light and dark, it opens and closes. It's just natural sometimes to just let the attention settle in, for example, with the hands. And then with the movement of our breath at the abdomen. And 
and that you might notice the attention opens up to sound again. That's fine. Then you might bring it back again to the movement of the breath. And we see how much we can start cutting into our idea of past and future. And just see again, oh, we start again with maybe we're halfway through the rising movement. Notice it disappear. That happened. We notice that disappear. Maybe a sound. That body sensation. Maybe we ground again. We notice the rising movement. So we start to let what's appearing be just as it is without having to control or fix or manipulate. And of course, if there's intense thoughts or emotions, it's really helpful to let the attention anchor more with the hands or breath or sound. It's like being in a strong wind. You don't want to let it completely blow you away. I'm just noticing if there's any disliking, irritation, annoyance, fear, aversion with any pain. That kind receptive attention. I can just let these things also appear and disappear without having to fix or control or manipulate them. Remembering we can care, care about any pain. And if there's anything pleasant, pleasant body sensations, pleasant sound, pleasant memories or thoughts, emotion, the Brahma Viharas are emotions, often very pleasant. Although the equanimity is neutral, more neutral, or neutral, that we can appreciate the freedom of that mudita for the appearance of equanimity. Or mudita for the appearance of anything pleasant or beautiful. It's, I appreciate the joy in my life.
appreciating if kindness appears, for example, or a receptive attention itself.
Just wanted to add in a little bit with the mudita. Um, we'll do some more and probably soon again, but I didn't do much with it. But just remembering that often it can be some very small thing, like maybe we saw a butterfly go by when you were outside today, right? Or it can. It doesn't have to be a huge, um, intense kind of pleasure or joy. It's more just um, noticing when there will be, um, like, it's like there's a, there's a talk about the quivering the heart in response to suffering, but there is a quivering in the heart in response to joy, right, and, and beauty. So it, it's just to remember that often um, we, we will get attached to something pleasant or beautiful, but, but in s we can work with that by s uh, having the attention open up and ap just appreciating that it's happening. It's like appreciating that there's pain, pleasure, neutral, right? There's a appreciating pleasure and joy for all of us, for all beings. So that just wanted to add that in. Do you have any questions today about your practice? Just the reminder, if you have a question uh, down at the bottom <clears throat> in the reactions button, you can click raise your hand and you'll have a raised hand. We'll see you. Cynthia has done. Hi, Cynthia. Oh, hold on. I have to be able to. Okay. You should be able to unmute yourself now. Okay. Hi, Cynthia. Hi. Um, well, my magic complicating mind has been hard at work and has teamed up with doubt. And um, I, and there's this, I have this kind of persistent thing in my life of I'm not doing it right, no matter what it is, what area. And um, and I've been aware of control in the practice and just to varying degrees. And it just seems like <laughs> if I'm at all present, I'm controlling what I'm doing on some level, and sometimes it's, you know, intense and, you know, I should be doing this or that, or I'm, you know, I'm really strongly focusing on something or whatever, or, and sometimes, and then I just kind of like, and then I, I'll say just, just relax and, Etc. But then I'm I'm deciding to relax, <laughs> and it's <laughs> it's like it's and I and then there's you know what I think of as skillful means, and I'm sort of gently guiding, uh, and so. But it just seems like there's always some element of control and um yeah or else I just yeah that's that's kind of my question 
or my my conundrum or whatever. Can I ask, um, where does the doubt come in? Well, the doubt is about like, what should I be doing, you know, and and I'm, um, you know, how do I get out of this? And the doubt is like this sense that in any given mind moment, there's something that is skillful means that I should be doing. Uh, okay, that's great. Uh, I can start. I think this is a great question for all of us. And I, I think that um, I don't think we usually ask this kind of question unless we've tasted um, a kind of equanimity that um, you sort of see the practice happens, happening by itself. It's like you're sort of you've had that experience and I think that when you've had that experience and then most of the time we're not having that experience, we we will have this idea that we should be having it more. So that that's one thing that just I think is um, really important to know that um, th that I don't want to spend too much time on because that's not what you're asking about, but I do think that the, the more you've tasted that, then the more you're going to have a, a comparing mind, which the Buddha said was madness, right? Like, but it, it is that sense that um, holding a carrot in front of ourselves and saying, well, we could, if I was doing it right, then skillful means would be appearing by itself. Because that's what it feels like at that at those junctures with deep equanimity. It'll feel like sk skillful means chooses itself. There isn't like a chooser that's choosing it. There, there isn't like an aversion or attachment that's choosing skillful means. And so I think this is a very layered question and has a lot of nuances. And I think it's coming from a lot of nuances. So to be careful, what I'm going to jump into this other place, which is um, being attached to the result of our effort. So that that's also a place I would recognize that doubt might be coming because if you were doing it right, right, right. then the, the result would look different. So all this indicates that you're wishing for more equanimity. <laughs> I know that place, you know, it's like we, we wish for more equanimity because we, we know it's possible. And then it's just like kind of um, knowing that's a hindrance that really gets you, right? It's So if you're vulnerable and things aren't kind of going along as we want them to be, it's it's a, it's like a cluster of the karmic knot and and but it sounds very it sounds subtle actually it doesn't sound it it might seem like it's intense but it doesn't sound when you're talking about it intense it sounds like um, you're right on that edge of seeing that the doubt is coming from not being able to um, control your experience yeah Which is Thank really, yeah, it's really hard. It's hard to see it. It's it's because that, the key is always like, you know, I'm kind of going through a time where there's really <laughs> like a lot of effort, but not, it's not um, going the way I'm wanting it to. And it's like, uh, it can feel like you're a failure because you're you're putting so much effort in, but you're not getting the result of the effort that you want. But actually, it's just like uncontrollable. And, you know, I can't control the result of what I want, right? So that they're, they're 
there are so many ways that manifests in our life. And, you know, lastly, I think, again, I think probably you're, you're applying a lot of skillful means, but you're, you're still not getting the result of what you want. And I think that's like, um, it's great practice. Anatta, 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 anatta. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I just maybe will say a little of that last, I think the last part of what Michelle said to just kind of emphasize, like, it's, it's not, it is, this is definitely practice is not about getting what you want, you know, and that's, <laughs> like, <laughs> it's just, and it's so painful. And so you're seeing that. And that's actually really wonderful. You know, I, I think just because it's painful doesn't mean it's bad practice, right? That you're actually seeing the truth of a few important things, right? Of like, that the, not only is the practice not about getting what we want, it's about seeing what you're seeing. It's about seeing the mind is incessantly trying to control everything, internally, externally, and that, and that we are identified with that controlling as me. I mean, that's, you're like you feel like you have bad practice but you're actually seeing like the heart of the matter you know the heart of like well, this is why we suffer <laughs> and so like i feel like it's it sounds wonderful <laughs> um but but there but there <clears throat> there is a difference of <laughs> excuse me being willing to that's that very almost imperceptible, very subtle shift into recognizing what we're seeing versus just seeing what we're seeing and feeling like it's bad practice. But to recognize it um, <clears throat> might be helpful, right? As like, oh, okay, there's, you, you're seeing, right? There's the controller, even, even when it's trying to do good practice or you know, change uh, approaches, you're seeing that there's this level of sort of tightness around and this manipulation and it feels like your failure right the me in it that's motivating it and the me that's the result the resulting failure is me right and then the the doubt that arises about yourself and life and practice and all the story and so it's just like where is that sort of interest in the doubt and interest in the controlling and interest in the self which is that's it i mean that's really i would say is like the only thing it's not like of course you could say well you should just go back to the breath and try to follow the breath or whatever you know kind of technical thing that you might be already trying you're probably already trying to do and feeling like you can't do it and so it's just to remember that it's like okay the breath is in the realm of the first foundation of mindfulness of the body and it's can be powerful and the body you know there's we can learn all we need to know no need to understand by observing the body but the mind is also a foundation of mindfulness right and understanding mind states and looking at identification and watching this process unfold and how is one thing leading to the next it's like the fourth foundation of mindfulness you know how do these how do all these phenomena create a sense of me you know and how is that suffering um so i, I think maybe it's just a matter of actually just shifting a little of your of valuing what's happening as legitimate uh, observable practice right what's happening in your mind the doubt and you, you're already seeing it but to recognize that as like good practice that you're seeing it might be enough to start to kind of also be interested in doubt and self in the controlling and how do these things kind of get so enmeshed and entangled because that's like the heart of the matter Jesse I don't know if it would be helpful if you turned your original sound off no. Mine was off. I can go. Oh. Is it just me? Is that what you're hearing? It's pretty, pretty. It sounds like you're in a windstorm. Okay. I'll, I'll move. Did you hear anything I said? Oh, we, yeah. you, can, yeah. you can hear it. Yeah, no, you can hear it. And if you can't change it, great. But it does sound like a kind of hurricane force wind. A slight exaggeration. <laughs> and, and what you said, what you both said was really helpful. Thank you both. Thank you.
Hi, Tracy. Um, I've been um, uh, practicing with something that um, I want to say I didn't choose. Um, not that we, not that we do any anything, but I had a. Um, I had an acoustic trauma about six weeks ago and I'm having high pitched ringing in my ears, in my ear. And I, you know, so, so I'm, I'm really grateful for the practice because it feels, it does feel like I'm in a storm. Um, and so, and I've been um, I've been appreciating actually that I've learned to some degree um, about like um, skillful effort because um, I I can't practice I I notice I can't formally practice as much I just can't handle it uh, and it's the distress that happens in response to this just um, at times very, very intense uh, sound and at best just it's just kind of always in the background. Um, it's really hard for me to talk about it because there's all it's just like wow it's just like the practice on steroids like I, I feel like I'm practicing all the time like um, it's, it reminds me of when I was early, when I started the practice, there was so much physical pain and it's so, it's like you can't really ignore it. Um, um, so, so, so a lot of, just having these moments where I might see like a sometime this week I saw this lone firefly <laughs> um, and just receiving that and those moments are like kind of what get me through but I my question is kind of um, I know at times I can just sort of observe that um, there's, there's so much taking this personally. Um, and then just being really caught up in that, um, the believing it too. And, and even then understanding that that would happen. Um, but there's this idea, you know, so that I've lost like refuge and i know that's not true but um like when i hear uh hewing around sound like i used to really enjoy the silence jesse do you want me to i am ready to start if Sure, okay, yeah. Um, I think there's there's times in life where it'll feel like there's so much loss. Like you so you I think that I hear a lot of grief, like a lot of loss and a lot of grief, and that's important to it's like a it's like a kind of death happened and um, sometimes we don't realize that that if you would if you could relate to this like that you might have more compassion for yourself in in terms of everything you're saying you know so that um, 
you might be more identified than you would like, for example, right? And and so there's this loss of what you did have in the practice. And um, but it's just like any time there's a death that we've gone through, we we get how powerful it is, and we usually cut ourselves some slack. So I think that cutting yourself some slack, um, I I think that's the f- top priority. It's just. Um, you know, it's like when we like are, I, I know it because I'm in one of those places physically. Uh, I keep getting more issues, you know, and not less. And it's like I feel like um, I'm really understanding the relationship to, of joy to strength, you know, to courage. And so like that the firefly, you, I could hear it in you, you know, it's just like that something, the goodness of that also gives us the courage to go through the difficult. So it's very important to like make, really seek that out and make time for it and to not do as much formal practice. That's, you're, you're totally doing what's important, you know. Um, and I, it's like, I only because I recognize it, just that sense of like, well, I didn't choose it. <laughs> like, it's, it's somehow, ah, you know, it's an aversion, right? Like, it's like, ah, da, da, da. somehow the karma has <laughs> presented it. And um, it's, uh, you've got a full plate. Full plate of dukkha. Yeah, so I would say the courage to even getting enough courage to um, do the compassion practice, for example. See, and Michelle, when you say that with the karma, that's where my thinking can go into a black hole about that I and get really personal about it. And it's really painful. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, Jesse can kind of come in too. I think that, um, uh, the Buddha said karma is un- imponderable and, and it's very important to kind of not get into the punishment and blame aspect that the Judeo Christian interpretation, it's just like, it doesn't, of course it doesn't help. So there's that Catholic, <laughs> The Catholic karma intersecting with the word karma, be careful. Just it's, But it's good practice to see how we relate to it. Um, usually this is when I have the, for me, I, I used to go through like with, the, I have intense body karma, very intense and it's winding up. And it's like, I used to just imagine that maybe I was Genghis Khan or something, you know, but then I thought, well, that's too like nice. Like I, I think this is more like basic. I kept thinking maybe I was a um, guillotine operator, <laughs> like just like a kind of indifferent guillotine operator. It's fun to kind of. I mean, for me, it's fun to kind of imagine, like where did this come from, right? But it's also just so important. You know, recently I've really been looking at all of us, at all beings, like ants, cats, everybody, and realizing we've all been each other's mother. We've all been each other's father, right? We've all been each other's kid, cousins. It's like so imponderable when you think, when you kind of try to take in why the Buddha even said it's imponderable. And that if we're in the human world, we're going to get hit by a lot of unpleasant stuff, you know, just it's the nature of being on this planet. So, yeah, I mean, I know it's hitting you hard, but, you know, it's good practice again to see where guilt and um, trying to find an easy way to kind of figure out why something's so painful versus that it actually, you can't, you'll never figure it out. 
and that's part of the kind of unknown it's unknown you know um, and how we're responding to what's happening in the present is how you liberate everything from the past really I think I, I just I liked when <laughs> Tracy when you you first started. It's like as soon as you said you were about to say that you know that certain sounds were a refuge. Like you knew that that's not really a, <laughs> a refuge. <laughs> you know what I mean? And like you knew that there was some folly in the notion of it, but that it was. But that right, of course, right that we we find these temporary refuges, temporary rafts of like you know, pleasant experience and, and beauty and joy and things that we, you know, appreciate and enjoy in life. And those have their place, you know, and, and it's hard when we lose one and it's hard when we're joined with the unpleasant and it's not clear, you know, if it if it's a lifelong thing or if it's short term or, you know, I'm, I'm, that's my assumption of, I don't, I don't know what your doctor has said, but I'm sure there's not, it's not, it's probably not clear, you know, what will happen or not. Um, but on the other hand, you know, part of why it's good practice, as Michelle is saying, is that it's like everything is undependable, right? And that nothing, nothing, nothing in this conditioned world is truly a refuge. And that's agonizing, you know, it's, and so when one thing gets taken away and then another thing and another thing and eventually everything gets taken away, right? It's like, that's the that's the truth of things and and it is really hard and yet it's also important you know and i think what's hard is that part part of the painfulness is hard period right of the sound and then there is the 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 hardship of not knowing about the future and uh you know that and then there's these doubts about the past right and, and my faultness around comma, you know, which is not useful. And and you have to be just as careful with the Buddhist stuff around karma as you do the Catholic stuff around karma. You know, it's not, it's like, just forget it. Don't worry about it. You recognize that everything is karma. Everything is the result of past action. And responsibility and identification with that is not worth even considering. But there is just this fact of, of the uh, a place where we found solace whether it is in a sound or the concept of some future version of ourselves or something got taken away or was threatened you know and we often don't realize how much we've built a sense of security around that being a certain way you know and it's heartbreaking and there's like this fall right there's a sense of well without that raft we it's like we're we fall and it's and there's something about do we recognize the tr do we find any solace in the truth of that right the truth of lack of refuge and and no matter how much we practice and it's like we still have to find these places where oh we were really ho we were really hoping that we would, this was going to be a certain way and we didn't really even see it that's how invisible a hope it was you know so you know it's like to, that has the only way you can the mind can bear that is by doing what michelle is saying of like the compassion part too right you can't just accept the truth of it without this heart softening enough to care about yourself and and the the pain of it you know and the grief of it and the sense of loss of it or the sense of fear about you know long-termness of it and at some points and that's probably not really now you know it's like you have to go through some process with it but there are there is some place where it's like yeah at some point you'll have to get interested in it you know in the grief and in the sound and 
and you, you you've learned to relate to it in the same way of like oh where can i be observe it and be interested is it really static is it changing uh is it an actual sound or is it a, a neurological experience right because often that's what they say it's like a lot of tinnitus type things are we lose hearing in a range of you know a certain range and the and the the brain kind of fills it in with the ringing yeah uh, and so it's like oh what what is this experience and then where is the fear and where is the and then where is it in the background and where is it really in the foreground and is it really the the does is it does it have the solidity that we also are afraid of and think that it has and um you know are terrified that it has and um you know usually that's it's not the case. And I'll just say, you know, I just, it's, I had this great interaction with a, a yogi here. We just finished up a retreat and she came to me, uh, you know, as like a sign up at the end of the retreat and was just like, I just wanted to say, I've been, I've started noticing like when I get really quiet, there's this just ringing, you know, and this, she has, she feels like it's like exquisite, you know, and that this sense of like, it's like this, this this uh like sound of quietude you know and equanimity and um and so we had a cool i was like oh i wasn't i didn't want to like you know i had to mention the word tinnitus at some point to be like i don't know you know like there's also this thing, thing that happens you know um and she was like no 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 no, no. i was like okay 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 you know like whatever just you know just hold that as a possibility that and one some Ajahn is it Ajahn Sumedho, like, you know, for a long time, he had this ringing that he called like the sound of silence. And he wrote like a book about it. And then at some point he was like, oh, no, it is just tinnitus. Someone talked to him, you know, a doctor was like, actually, you have tinnitus. <laughs> and, and so it's like, just to get that perspective that there is the sound itself actually unpleasant. Or is it the notion of what it is that's unpleasant? right and the future of it and the loss of it and all of these you know the the, the conceptual experience around it um it could be the sound itself is unpleasant i'm not saying it's not but i think it's like an important question right just because when i have when you have see these experiences of people having m maybe less intense but growing uh, experiences of a ringing um that there's like a very wide range of experiencing it you know uh and want someone being like excited about it, never mind, you know, whatever. And I'll maybe just say for myself, I, I have, I have over the years had kind of developed more dynamic tinnitus, uh, and it, and it just keeps changing. And it's not go, it's not about going away. It's more like I start to notice like, like different layers of it, and there's different tones and. I certainly wish it wasn't there. And I, it's not just when I'm proud. It used to happen just when I was getting really quiet. And now I pretty much can notice it there most of the time if I, um, especially if I kind of tune into it. But a lot of times it tunes out. And the doctor said, oh, yeah, the brain also can learn to do that. You know, the brain learns to sort of like dial it back because it's like, oh, it's, you know, so so there's part of it that's actually not up to us, you know, that the the brain, the mind is is sort of, kind of calibrating, you know, the something, and we're sort of along for the ride, you know. Um, but yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, I think uh, I, I want to add a little something mm -hmm. just, um, just for everybody that the cro chronic pain withers the mind. And so it it, it is when you have a certain kind of chronic intensity of pain, again, it's it's helpful to get um, to just to remember to get enough um, beauty as a form of mudita again that can give you the energy that to then have enough courage to be with the the chronicness of it. Because it's if you look at it, you know, and it's like what Jesse's describing and interest takes energy it takes a certain amount of energy to have the interest uh, I'm, I'm describing a certain way of working with it that um, can allow for some interest or 
some humbleness around um, not being interested <laughs> because sometimes I remember when I had shingles, uh, it was so painful that it took me six weeks to get interested in it. And I remember when I got interested in it because it was such a shock. It was like, oh, there's interest. Like it was so, but it was like shocking that it took six weeks, right? I was like kind of upset with myself for like it taking that long, but actually it was just like, okay, see these things, it's just, um, you, that's why there's an instruction, check to see, check to see, check to see if, the, if you can do this or not, or without that extra overlay of um, judgment that you can or cannot, uh, that the skillful means, as, as Cynthia was asking, if it's working or not working, it's much more a question of, Always, um, it comes down to being with what is, you know, and how it is. Uh, and as Jesse is describing, his tinnitus has gotten more intense. <laughs> you know, it's like, it didn't go away, right? So, um, it's, a, it's an interesting process of being with how things are unfolding. Thank you. Yeah. I, I do want to just say that compassion and metta have just arise, and I'm so grateful for it. Uh, it feels like so helpful, and it and from all the practice and being with all of you has helped that. Hi, Queen. Um, listening to uh, Tracy and you, Michelle and Jesse, uh, I feel kind of terrified that life for us is so scary that there's no way out. Um, so. My question is equanimity. Is the equanimity of the Brahma Viharas the same as the equanimity of mindfulness? Or does it matter to know the difference? The reason I asked that was um, when my husband died, I had to deal with a lot of emotions. And one emotion is the regrets that I didn't have more compassion and kindness for him. So it, it just gnawed at my heart. And no matter what I tell myself that um, it's okay that uh, you know, humans and no matter what I do, practice, I still have that uneasy feeling. It, it's like putting Band-Aid into a deep wound. And, and then I don't know what happened, but last week, all of a sudden, I thought, you know, I had so much respect for, for the regrets and the guilt that I have, that, that it's okay. And then it didn't bother me anymore. So that's my question. What, what brought it, 
the acceptance and so that I learn to practice that. I mean, I can start. I just, you know, it's hard to say, Quinn, like, you know, for us, like, wh what happened in that moment for you? But it's, I would say it's, it sounds very powerful. And, and the, the, the question of if concentration, equanimity, and mindfulness, equanimity are the same thing, I, I don't want to get like distracted by the question to like what you're kind of deeper offering is here, you know. And so I, I think that the, you, you just, you point to something that's so important and, and it is hard to explain and, it, and it's hard to fathom and it's so powerful and so beautiful that you had this experience because, you know, you can imagine, you know, like for, for, for us or for me to hear you say, oh, you know, I feel guilty about not having enough compassion for my husband. And you can imagine in my mind, there's this like, oh my God, Quinn, like, you know, how much you did and how many years. <laughs> Right. So there's this like the version of it that's kind of like what you also also do clearly. Right. You're like you could talk yourself into a rational explanation of how it's not true and you shouldn't feel bad and you did what you could and da, 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 da. And yet you must have some experience of moments where you acted out of aversion. Right. Or you acted out of exhaustion or and and or just wanting something else to happen so that like whatever the overall story could be, whatever the, the version of, you know, when, when they write your biography, when they'll talk about how great you took care of everything, it's like, you know that something in your own behavior wasn't up to your own standards. And that's painful, especially when it's someone you care about and it's someone that's in, uh, you know, the end of their life and in a very tender place. And and so you're, it's like that, that line between where is it healthy, like that here in Otapa, right? You, you're experiencing the difference between the unhealthy shame and remorse and regret turning into something that is like healthy, you know, or do they say moral, moral shame, moral dread, right? Difficult language, very hard. You have to, we have to be so careful with the English kind of translation, but this sense of ownership of action that is exactly equanimity. It's the kamasaka, right? May we be owners of our actions. And that you, it's like you, you stop running from the shame and from the guilt and you accept that in, in whatever moments you might be remembering and whatever moments, you know, and that's part of what's hard is like you, you, out of all of the generous and beautiful and caring moments, there were some that were not <laughs> and because of whatever your makeup and your practice and your your aspiration you're focusing on those ones you know even though we might say don't worry about those compared to the other one it's like you're sensitive to that and and yet it's like you stop running from the shame of it and you accept it's true you know i i i, re I recognize that in those moments i was behaving out of you know, uh, aversion. And, and you don't need to rationalize it, right? It's all understandable. You get, you're exhausted, you get everything. And yet there is this truth. And when you stop running from it and can feel it, well, then it's not haunting you in the same way. It's like, okay, you suddenly like the, the whole atmosphere opens and it's like, you also can recognize your goodness. You can recognize the other actions. You recognize that we are fallible, that it's so hard to be human. It's so hard to do this. Even with as much practice and as much support as we had, it's like so hard, you know? And so this sense of like evenness that you're presenting of like, it's okay, you know, that you, you acknowledge it and that it's okay because you understand, right? And because you're not fighting it or resisting it. 
And you can see also just like how that helps you relate to other people and their mistakes, you know, and their, all of our failures and, you know, uh, when any of us don't live up to our aspirations, you know, how beautiful it is to, to offer what you're offering. So, you know, thank you. Yeah, I just think it's really important. And I would say that is the voice, that is the wisdom equanimity over the concentration <laughs> equanimity. Yeah. It's it's so painful and humbling to recognize that. But once I recognize that, it's okay. It's okay. The pain or whatever is all right. I, I would just add that um, Jesse answered this beautifully and perfectly. So I, I, sometimes I think of this particular kind of equanimity as a kind of grace. Uh, the, the word grace can be complicated for us, but I say the word grace because we try to figure out where it came from, but actually that's why I like to call it grace because it just um, it's because of all your practice that it appeared so yes the wisdom is the condition for that to appear but it it just doesn't come out of nowhere it 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 comes out of the grace is really all the years you've put into practice and to have it be um, I really, I really appreciate this a lot because you're accepting your humanity. It's like an acceptance, a deep acceptance of humanity. And I, I really think it's the difference between a pseudo saint, the pseudo saints and the saints, because that, that, that recognition of our humanity and working with it and being honest uh, versus, um, not being able to face it is just so, um, it's really the difference between night and day. So I really, again, appreciate that you shared it, but also to not be looking for, oh, um, in, the, the, in those moments, this, this moment led to this moment versus uh, equanimity will appear like it happened suddenly, mm -hmm. right? Right, it'll appear sudden, but it actually is based on lifetimes <laughs> of practice. Well, thank you, everybody. to see you all take care of yourselves and the people in your lives and we'll see you next week inshallah <laughs>